say good morning. Welcome to beautiful Sunday morning this morning to worship Him. Thank you all for coming out. Welcome the visitors. Um, we could have a good service and worship Him. I had to think on the way to church this morning, another beautiful morning, as I said. You know, there were some people that went to church last Sunday morning that didn't don't have an opportunity to go this morning because God called them home. Who's not going to be here next Sunday morning? It's just a challenge I thought of, you know. Let's be ready. Let's be ready to go. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you this morning. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we could gather like this. Thank you for everybody that's here. Lord, we ask you would just go with us this morning. Be with Sunday school teachers. Give them words to speak. Be with one of the devotions. Also the one that breaks the message. We might apply our hearts to you. Have our cups turned up. And we might grow closer to you. Best you just go with all and makes a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we'll look to the song leader for some songs and then have our devotions by Anthony. Let's begin with number 48 in the hymns of the church. Forty-eight. One. Those who are able can stand. One hundred one.
Good morning. For a devotional this morning, let's turn to Revelation 22. Revelation 22, beginning in verse 6, reading to 17. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, and I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant." 
and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the the gates into the city, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. So this passage is similar in some ways to the Sunday school lesson this morning, speaking of the end times and um, what's going to happen. But it helps to answer, there's a few differences, and it helps to answer Daniel's question in today's lesson text, O oh Lord, what shall the end of these what shall be the end of these things? Um, Daniel couldn't see all the way to the end, and um, John was given a little bit more of an insight into the end there. Um, but as with Daniel, God had sent his servants to reveal some things, and these are faithful and a true, sta- uh, true saying. In verse 16 there, he goes over his, his lineage. He's on the authority that he... Um, can speak on these things. He's the offspring, and Dave, uh, offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Um, we can trust that um, what he told John is accurate. Um, uh, in verse 10, he, sa- he saith, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. This is in stark contrast uh, to what's in the Sunday school lesson today, where he said, Seal it up. Um, put it away. The, the time is not here yet. Um, but here in John, or when he was talking to John in Revelation here, he said, don't seal it up. Leave it open. Uh, it's going to be soon. Um, and today the invitation is still open. Um, it's not too late yet. Uh, we can see that um, in verse 17. Uh, come, and let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, take of the water of life freely. It's given freely. The invitation is still open today. It is not too late. Um, But eventually it will be too late, and we can see that in verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. At that that point, it's going to be too late to make um, any changes that we haven't already. But at the same time, if we are living right and we are ready, the rest of that verse also applies. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So it just goes to remind us again that it's to, our decisions today will affect our eternal destiny. Um, that's not a decision that we can make at the end. The decision for that is today. Um, there is a yeah. There, there is a time when that invitation will be ended. It won't um, be available anymore. Then verses 12 through 15 there go into more um, uh, reward for the ones who have um, lived right and uh, also the reward for those who have not. Um, Yeah, so um, blessed are they which do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. You know, God has prepared us or is preparing a city you can read about that in the rest of Revelation, a beautiful place, a reward for um, his uh, servants who are living right. But then outside that, in verse 15, are dogs and sorcerers, warmongers, murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. And we've heard um, good reminders this week of uh, living right and making sure that we are inside the city and not without, as it says here. 
So, yeah, in the last verse there, 17, and the Spirit and the Bride say, come. Um, we are a part of the Bride of Christ. Um, let's just remember that, and let's live our life so that we can be part of that um, that bride one day and be in the city instead of without. Um, with these thoughts, let's kneel for prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, just thank you for the, your open invitation you have given us this morning, and just help us to take advantage of that invitation before it is too late, and um, to make the changes that we need to in our lives, and come to the fountain and drink freely, and cleanse ourselves and cleanse our hearts, Lord, and just help us to also remember those who are without, and to um, invite them to come in as well, Lord. And help us to have a passion for the lost and want to reach them as well, that they can uh, come in and um, have that eternal reward that you have prepared for us as well. Just be with the Sunday school teachers now as we go into Sunday school. Just help them to share what you've laid on their hearts and help us to have good discussion and profitable um, learning time. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Anthony, for those reminders. Very good chapter to read out of. Are you satisfied where you're going this morning? You know where your destination is. Have you totally sold out to Christ? Time's here for Sunday school. Let's dismiss the youth and intermediate. Juniors. Primaries. Preschool. And the adults can take their places. You were standing. I didn't did it three twice out of. You should have just emerged. Yeah. Got up. Well, welcome to uh, Sunday school out of time. So, usually, as is my practice, a week before I'm supposed to teach, I open up my Sunday school lesson on Sunday afternoon and start reading. And last Sunday, I don't know why, but I opened it up while Michael was up here teaching in the middle of Sunday school. And I read September 15th lesson, or I read lesson title. The very first part says a time of trouble. 
And I said, oh, no, that started now. <laughs> we have an interesting lesson before us. And I hope y'all are way more enthused to talk about this than what came to me over the past week. But I think there's something to learn here. In the first two lessons from Daniel, we saw Daniel exemplifying faithfulness to God in spite of many tests that challenged him. In today's lesson, we see him being a faithful prophet of future events, even though he did not completely understand the future that God is revealing to him. Jesus specifically called him Daniel the prophet. What is a prophet? That's a question I'm asking you all. What is a prophet? Spokesman for God. Spokesman for God. Any other descriptions? Telling the future. Telling the future. Uh, talking of future events. Talking yeah. of future events. Anything else? I don't have a certain answer I'm looking for. Okay, our focus today is to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ, not fearing the turmoil in the world and the judgment that will come on the ungodly. <clears throat> not fearing the turmoil in the world and the judgment that will come on the ungodly. Why did they not put anything in our focus about not fearing the judgment of the godly? Is the judgment of the godly something for Christians to fear? No. No. That's a cut and dried answer. Something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. Amen. All right, Daniel 12, time of trouble. Let's just go ahead and read our lesson before us. Doug, you want to start? At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting content. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and to knowledge shall be increased. All these things shall be finished. Then I, Daniel, looked, and, behold, there stood another two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man, quote, <clears throat> And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end? Shall, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he pulled up his right hand, and he left, left hand under heaven, and he wear him. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be at the end of these things? He said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And he shall be glorified in his way and shall but the wicked shall be wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the honest shall understand. And from the time that daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. But go thou thy way to the end of the day, for thou shalt rest, and stand in thy law at the end of the day. <coughs> okay. The book of Daniel is largely prophetic, um, beginning back to chapter 2, and Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as we go down through the chapters. 
chapter 7 depicts the uh, four world kingdoms that would come. Um, each of them is presented by a fierce animal, you know, the first of the lion, which some people focus on that being the kingdom of Babylon. The bear points to major empire, Medo-Persian, leper appears to be the Grecian empire. And on down through, Daniel 8 presents a vision of a ram and a goat, and again representing the kingdoms that would come. Ninth chapter portrays 70 weeks of Gentile supremacy believed to be until the time of Christ. And the final three chapters of Daniel are a further vision about the nations and also the time of the end. Just kind of a few thoughts for introduction as we go into this portion here before us. So there's some words that we can do a word study on. We won't get too in depth on them, but verse 1 what does standeth? For um, me, stand up for. How would you, how would you describe that if someone were to ask you what that means? Charge of, charge of. And then down to verse 4 is the other word that I wanted to pick out. Two words, shut up. What, what, um, if we were to dissect that, those two words in the context that it's written, what would shut up the words? What would that, how would you describe those two words to someone? We might get into that verse later on as we study that portion. We can just wait till we get down to that one. It might make more sense. So, as you read, as we read these verses that we read, is there any hope of deliverance? For whom? For whom? For the people it's writing about. Is there any hope of deliverance? that time, thy people shall be delivered. So your answer would be yes. So who delivered them? Is my next question. So, verse 1, who is Michael? And Michael Weaver is not here this morning, so you can't pick on him. <laughs> who is Michael in our, chat, in our text? Michael is the Lord. Or what does Michael mean in our text? Maybe you could ask it that way. Who is Michael? The Archangel. Could be. It's not where my mind is going. But I'm not saying I'm right. He's mentioned back in chapter 10, verse 13. Is that where he's described as the great prince? No, here he's described as the great prince. One of the chief princes, it's from the ID, but it should be similar. And that was. So, where I was going with this, Michael's name. I could be wrong, but I believe Michael's name means like unto God. Bible times, or 
like unto God or who is God, who is like God, something like that. He's described somewhere, I guess it's written down the verse, as, as the great prince. So if we think about that, so he's described as the great prince for these folks in the writings today. So who stands up for us today? Michael is going to stand up for these people. Who stands up for us today? In 2024, who stands for us today? Christ. Christ. The Son of God. The Son of God. And the Son of God is an image of who? Father. And Michael was the great prince who was an image of God a step back farther, right? My mind might be going down rather the paths that you aren't following, that's all right. So no, I, th- I would agree with you, Ron, because Michael's also the guardian of God's people. He's the guardian of God's people. In Jude 9, he specifically called the Archangel Michael. Yeah. In the commentary, uh, it says, Michael the Archangel is mentioned several times in Scripture as the protector of God's people. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I already asked who is going to be delivered. We said God's people. Or I would also like to pull out to those who have their name found where? Verse 1, written in the book of, of life. So how do you get your name in that book under the old law? Let's go back to culture, go back to the old law. How do you get your name in that book under the old law? The same way we do today, by faith. That's kind of where my mind is going. Things didn't change from back then to today on how we get there. It's by faith. No, they didn't have the crucifixion at this time, but it was still by faith. And by faith, we hold on to the fact of what God has done for us and who he has sent to deliver us. So in the first section that we read, what happens to the dead? Resurrected. They're resurrected. That's what it says. They shall awake. All of them or some of them? Verse 2 it says, and many of them asleep. But, but it says, some to everlasting life and some to shame, everlasting contempt. Oh, um, yeah, all of them. All that sleep. Some will be alive. Don't you think? So the ones that are going to shame and everlasting contempt, will they await it? Mm-hmm. the last judgment. No? I'm asking a question. <laughs> there is actually more than one stage to the resurrection. The revelation <laughs> says the rest of the dead will not live again until... <laughs> this lesson before us, <laughs> is one that you could have a split of a church ten different ways. Depends how strongly people feel about it. Yep. I'm not going that deep this morning. Because I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you my opinion on the matter. <laughs> well you're the teacher, you have the right to do it. And I look up and see a camera staring at us. And you're still gonna get my opinion. <laughs> Just go you, take a shot. You can have as strong of a belief on the end times as what you want to, and you can stand on your head that you are the only one that's right, and let me tell you, you're going to be wrong. It's my belief. Well, we have 18 of us here. Ain't none of us got it figured out. Some of you probably have it more figured out than what I do. And for many years, I trembled at the end times. But you know what? There's a verse in the Bible that God says, don't be fearful. And there's another verse that that says that God will walk with us each day of our life. And you know, when the eastern skies break open and Jesus comes for us, it doesn't matter what Roger Fold thought. The end time is going to look like he's coming back for his redeemed. 
is our name in that book of life. It is the only main question for us to entertain this morning. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. All right. Let's not have an argument about it anytime soon. No, I wasn't. We aren't, we aren't headed there. But, you know, there are some folks that get very opinionated. You know what? It's going to happen how it happens, but let's not just bury our head in the sand and say we don't need to study those verses either. That's what I did for too many years. Okay. So verse 2, I have another question about the last verse. <coughs> what is shame and everlasting contempt? What's your thoughts on this section? I rambled a lot on mine. As you study, do you have anything that jumped out at you? If not, let's go on to verse 4. So he's telling Daniel to shut up the words and seal the book. mean to you. Don't add to it. Don't add seal to it. it. Close it. Seal it up. Would I have a thought of for safekeeping? Safekeeping? Preserve that. Preserve it. <laughs> Keep going. This is all good. Treasure them. Is the next phrase at all important even to the end of the even to the time of the end? Is that clause in there that we can pull out for importance? Where I'm going with that thought is we seal it up, we preserve it until the end of time when it's all open and revealed to us how it's all going to be. At the end of time, I believe that we are going to know it all. The devotional this morning pointed out that there was, there was a little more that we can understand now because we've come to I guess you could say the last time period before Christ returns and we have the book of Revelation now so there's a little book more that's been added to the predictions of what's going to happen but we still don't we still don't understand very much at all, comparatively speaking. And I'm reminded, it says in Galatians, that in the fullness of the time to come, God sent forth his Son. There were enough details predicted in the Old Testament that they could say, that's being fulfilled. That's fulfilled now. This is happening. He's here. see all those time frames and yet they still in the background. Are we any different today? Is that sad to say we're no different today. We even have more knowledge than what they had back then. 
and sad to say that many people still bury their head in the sand. Do we have more knowledge than what they did back then? Uh -huh. Yeah. Less wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> more knowledge, less wisdom. We have more happenings that we can point to. Uh -huh. Yeah. We have the written word. Yes. We have the written word. And we have the death and resurrection. I agree with you. We have access to more resources, documented resources than others have. It's not, not that we're smarter than anyone else, but I, I always find it interesting, you know, when phrases in the Old and the First Testament and then the uh, phrases in the Second. So, many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall be increased. And my thought just went to Timothy, where it says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many podcasts and how many seminars and how many opportunities we have to learn running to and fro? And I'm not talking about the running to and fro that Travis referred to on Monday evening. I am just running after more and more information and, and, and sessions. question that burns in my mind for the past many months and you uh, popped the lid on it. But why do so many people run to and fro to all these seminars and all these podcasts? Why are we always searching for the next podcast to listen to? Why are we always searching for the next meeting that we can go to? Why are we always trying to gain more knowledge. Why are we doing that? What's it for? So you can have a busier life? Are we wired that way so we don't stop looking at here? Those no. <laughs> no? No. That's my opinion. Well, if we Is are, it the difference between those people looking in the wrong places and not the right place? Uh, no, there. Okay, I might have taken you wrong. Yeah, we're looking at the wrong if place. If we were quote unquote satisfied, we close this up and never open it again. Yeah. I'm not saying we should be totally that would actually satisfied. be the first part of the verse. Seal the yeah. word, and they will stand. And they will stand. Preserve it. Treasure them. Here they are. So the question I've had in regards to all that is, is, is it because we're trying to find something to appease our hearts? to justify why we're doing what we're doing, other than just digging into the Word and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm all messed up, let's just change our ways. Which is easier, to buy another tool or to use the one you already have? You have an excuse to buy the tool, really. <laughs> you, You've never stepped foot in a snap-on truck, have you? <laughs> I couldn't afford it. <laughs> Brother Travis talked about going to a seminar or having a business coach that it just clicked with him. And, and he made a commitment and, and he changed his pattern and, and it was a blessing. He didn't go on and tell, tell us his complete journey, but imagine with me if that would, hey, if this is good, more should be better. And let's say he's continuing going after coach after coach and seminar after seminar to improve his business. I don't think he is because he really hammers us on business. Does that make sense? So he found that nugget and he's putting it into practice. He's living it out. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to take that cookie and eat it, not ask God for more cookies when we haven't consumed the first one. I guess a little backside to why that question's been heavy on my mind is that I, I deal with a guy that I've been working with for many years and trying to shape a pattern that uh, the mold in his life is obviously very hard cast iron that doesn't want to be bent and I get tired of always hearing about the next podcast 
in the next, well, this channel. Or, you know, you gotta listen to this speaker. No, I don't. And I refuse to listen to what he said I should listen to because I'm trying to reshape his life. But he's not willing to just open up the Bible and let it shape in the ways that it needs to be shaped. Alright, we got totally off some buddy trails. Verse 4, we already talked about shutting up the words, seal in the book. Let's go on to uh, let's go on to the next section. Um, I don't know what stood out to you, but I have a question on verse 8. And I want to ask a question before I open up verse 8. But the question is, is do you consider Daniel a wise man? Nebuchadnezzar did. I liked it too. And I reread this verse this week. And it troubled me. And I said, well, God, if Daniel is as wise as I always thought he was, and then he just puts right in here, and I heard, but I understood not. How are you and I going to understand? What does verse 8 mean? There's a similar reason that we spend a lot of this time pursuing knowledge, never learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth, because we're discontent not to let some things in God's hands. Mm -hmm. I think you said a very good phrase, content to let some things in God's hands. Because if we knew it all, would we need any faith? Mm -hmm. Nope. Near the end of Deuteronomy, it says that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong to us and to our children. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand, prophecy, the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. Unto whom, meaning unto the prophets, it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you. So concerning the first advent of Christ and his work on the cross, that was predicted in the Old Testament. And when the, the prophets who related that revelation from God to their initial hearers and wrote it down, they didn't understand it. They didn't they could understand that maybe some of what God was going to do, but they certainly didn't understand all of how he was going to do it. We can understand it better excuse me, sorry. We can understand it better now because it's already happened. Could it be somewhat the same way with what's going to happen yet in the future with this second? Didn't they try to fill in the blanks with so they were insisted that Jesus was coming to set up an earthly kingdom. Mm -hmm. And they rode that to the point of killing him. Mm -hmm. Today, we see a lot of people with prophecy trying to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And like you said, get very opinionated about it. And will, are willing to die on the hill almost. Of, this is how it's going to be. And are unwilling to humble themselves and say, I understand not. I need a dose of humility. We all need a dose of humility. One thing when Jesus was asked about some details concerning the end times, there's lots of things he said. But when he was asked when, it seems he didn't answer the question, but he did. He says, be ready, be watchful, be ready.
Well, that second bell is going to ring in about two minutes. In the third section, I think we could spend an hour a little more. The wise shall understand. <laughs> so if you understand this morning, then I guess you're wise. But I feel very ignorant. This man that Daniel was talking to, we don't really know who he was. Verse 9, he says, Go thy way, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. I really wanted to ask one of you to paraphrase that verse. But basically, I think it simply means go about your business, Daniel. It's not for you to know about or to fret about right now. But at the end of time, it'll all be revealed. In conclusion, no matter how great the trials, God will deliver his own. Death is not the end. Resurrection will come. Some will go into eternal darkness and damnation. Some will shine forever like the stars. Did you ever stop to wonder if the stars that they're finding out in space now are actually Christians who have went on before shining? Just a thought that I've had in the past. God has the future security in his control. He will bring the end when the time is right. We are to, to be busy and are not to fear because of the world events. Two kinds of people will always, always exist. The righteous will be white, purified, and trapped. Blessings lie in being faithful to the end. We dismiss it.
Sunday school hours here to close. A few things to announce here. Uh, we did some changes in the women's classes. Tried to do a little better at dividing up. So take a look at that. Um, there is some that are swapped from class to class. So that'll start next Sunday. Also changing the mailboxes again. So check your name before you grab everybody else's mail. So this time we'll turn the time over, uh, have a few songs and turn the time over the ministry. So number 630 in the hymns of the church. 630. <clears throat> oh, my faith has found. Five hundred fifty four. Five hundred fifty four.
21. Three hundred twenty one. Good morning. Welcome to our service here this morning. It's good to see everybody here. Welcome visitors. Glad you're here also on the ending of a week of revival meetings here at Sunlight. So that's what's been happening here. Got a few announcements, a number of announcements maybe. Um, I want to get to there's a survey that's been handed out a couple weeks ago. Today is the deadline for the survey on church plant, church outreach. Please get those handed in and we can process them, I guess, and evaluate the view and the vision of Sunlight Chapel. So those are supposed to be in today. By way of prayer request, um, we had announced that Richard Wilma's sister passed away in a tragic accident, so those calling hours are today, and funeral tomorrow, and sadness and grief, and a young girl passing. Remember them, remember the family in this time. So there has been a chorus being organized and the time has come for registration. So here's some information. Registration for the chorus here at Sunlight will 
be open today. There will be an electronic form to fill out to um, register if you want to sing on the chorus. Anybody who is 14 years and older is eligible and allowed to participate. If you want a physical paper form to fill out, Anthony will make that available to you if you ask. So he will later today at some point make that registration available via men's chat and the ladies chat and he'll be posting something on the bulletin board. That registration is open until August, October 14 with rehearsals starting in November. So you can consider all those things if you want to sing. And I know from the past chorus that rehearsals are important and you will be required to be at all rehearsals. So think about that and go ahead and sing on the chorus anyway, but it is a commitment is what I'm saying. Remember this evening we'll take an offering for, a love offering for Brother Travis for coming and sharing in our midst. Also, I ask for your prayers this next week. Um, Rhoda and I will be going to Farmington, Missouri, Bethel Fellowship Church there, and have revival meetings starting Tuesday night through Sunday night. So you can pray in that end, toward that end. Got a number of birthdays to look at. Does somebody else have an announcement that needs made that maybe I don't know? Okay, birthdays this morning or today. Kenrick Steiner has a birthday today, so happy birthday, Kenrick. Also, Mason Halteman has a birthday on Monday. Caleb Auker on Tuesday. Teresa Miller has a birthday on Wednesday. Deb Steiner. Dorf Geyser and Keelene Hurst all celebrate a birthday on Thursday. So happy birthday to all of you. May the Lord bless you in that. So the offering this morning is for general fund, and I want to remind us that it is for the building project, updates, new doors, so the ushers can come forward at this time. pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the beautiful day, the day of opportunity, day of rest and worship. Thank you for being able to gather in this way. May you bless each one who is here, prepare our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. We thank you for the way you have supplied our needs in this land of plenty we live in, and we thank you for that. We ask that you would bless this gift. It would be used for the building fund. It would be used wisely you can maintain the church. Build us up, and may you make us a blessing in this community here where you have planted us. And we pray for that vision, what you would have us to do, which way you would have us to go in the future from here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for sharing in that way. Time has come, this time of the service has come, where we want to hear a word of the Lord. So we want to lift our brother to the throne of grace. I'm going to ask us all to kneel for a prayer.
Father, we humbly come into your midst this morning as we acknowledge the power of your word and that it, it, the effect it has on our hearts. And Lord, we ask that you would minister to our needs as we sit in your presence and you know us inside and out. We lift Brother Travis to you. May you anoint him, anoint the message, make speaking easy for him, give us listening ears, hungry hearts, to absorb that which is presented and preached. We give you all the honor and the glory, and pray you bind the powers of Satan that he could not distract in this meeting here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Extend Christian greetings to each of you this morning. Greet you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Redeemer. The reason we are gathered here in this way. It's good to see everyone here this morning. I trust that you are hungering and thirsting after righteousness this morning. Oftentimes in a week of revival meetings, the Sunday morning service is kind of dedicated towards family life, raising children, marriage, that type of thing. And this morning is no exception to that. I'd like to bring us a message this morning on marriage relationships in the home between husband and wife. As we observe our nation around us, the society that we live in, I believe there's a saying, I don't have it exactly down pat, but something to the effect, as goes the family, the home, so goes the church. As goes the church, so goes society. As goes society, so goes the nation. Something to that effect. The burden of my heart this morning is that we have strong families, strong marriages, homes that children can be raised in, in the fear of the Lord, and that they can be, grow up and, and be taught the gospel of Jesus Christ and can be strong pillars in the church, that the church of Jesus Christ can go forth in power and in might. <clears throat> Now, I know that there's some of you that are not married here this morning. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. I trust that there is something that you can be challenged in this morning, something that you can take home, something that God speaks to you. The message title this morning is Marriage for God's Glory. Now, there's a variety of, of uh, years that people have been married here this morning. I don't know if there's anybody that's been married for over 50 years here this morning, is there? Okay, a few. Praise God for that. I distinctly remember something that has always stuck with me is when my wife and I, we left for our honeymoon and we were at the airport and the place we were flying to was a place where a lot of people would go for honeymoons so there was a lot of young married couples in the lobby of the, of the terminal there that we were at. And I overheard two men talking to each other. And they were asking each other how long that they were together before they got married. And this one man, he was telling the other one, well, we were together for about five years or so. And, and we decided, hey, you know, why not get married and see if it works out? And it just struck me as I, as I thought about that. Is, that. is that our approach to marriage? Is that our approach to life in Christianity? Life in the church? Let's see if it works out. Or are we committed? Are we committed? So when we come to the marriage altar, your marriage is not for you. It's for God. It's for His glory. And it, re and it represents Christ and the church. And as we observe marriages, couples together, God, I think, has a sense of humor sometimes of how He brings people together. And these opposites attract each other and they get married to each other and then they need to work out life together. And that can be interesting. It can be an adventure, and it can lead to conflict, and it can lead to difficulty. I think some of the reason is that we're attracted to someone that is not like us. Because 
If everyone was like me, everything would be boring. Okay? I had mentioned to the youth the other night at the pizza supper that my wife told, told me after we were married that when we first were together in the youth group that she told her friends that she would never, ever marry that Travis Burkholder. He is, yeah, she had a few adjectives to describe what she thought of me then. Well, I think God has a sense of humor. I think he does. So the only time you should say never is to never say never. Okay. But as I mentioned, the marriage is for his glory and, and what it represents. It represents Christ and the church. Now God, throughout his story of his people, throughout the Old Testament, he desired a people that was separate, come out from among them and be ye separate, thus saith the Lord, be different from the society around them. And there were distinctives that he placed on that, that people could see that these are, the, are God's people or these are the Jews. And it's no different Today, inside of the church and inside of how he has designed this to work, is that there's a distinctive that is visible for what is manifested in the church. And that is marriage. As we go about society, husbands and wives that love each other, that care for each other, is a picture of what Christ has done for the church. So as we are walking around in society and, and interacting with society, we are representing Christ and the church. And it should be a compelling vision. It should be something that people see the relationship between husband and wife. They see families that love each other. They see children that respect mom and dad. And it's something that they say, I don't know what that is, but I want it. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians to the fifth chapter. We've looked at Ephesians some this week. And as I ponder and look at Ephesians, and we see through the first three chapters the other night in the message on the identity in Christ, we see what our foundation needs to be. And then he goes into, into chapter 4 and he exhorts us to be of one mind, to be unified together, one spirit, and our gifts that we are given by Almighty God is for the, for the development of the church, for the building of the church, for the edifying of the church. The gift that you have is not for you, but it is for the church. It is to build up. So if you're a member here of Sunlight Chapel or wherever you are from, the church that you're a part of, your talents, the things that you have are not for you, but they are for the church and they are for God's glory and not for you. And that, our marriages, that is, that is what it is. And... and I, I, my heart is this morning that we would grasp the reality of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 as a foundation. And then as young people, we would go in and we would recognize what chapter 4 talks about unity. And then uh, he talks in chapter 5 about uh, being followers of God as dear, dear children there in verse 1. He's, he starts in and he goes on and he ends with this exhortation to be submissive one to another. And then he goes into marriage. What type of foundation do we have going into marriage? I would to God that we would have these principles down pat. We would have this, we would have this foundation before we enter into marriage. Our first commitment as, as young people, before we think about dating or getting into a relationship, we need a foundation with the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Have a relationship with Him. And following Him. Let's read... In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through the end of the chapter. Paul is writing here. Verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause... 
Shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let any one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. May God bless the reading of the word. I've preached at a lot of weddings in our congregation over the last six years. We've had numerous weddings, and I often am asked to share in those weddings. And one of the recent weddings that I, was sh- that I shared at, I usually ask the couple beforehand, is there anything in particular that you'd, is there a passage or something that you'd like? And this couple asked me, they said, you know, can we talk about, would you, would you talk some about blending our differences? And that type of thing. And I thought, yeah, isn't that, isn't that what marriage is? Isn't that what church life is too? We don't all think alike. We don't all get the same thing out of a passage of Scripture. That's one of the beautiful things about Sunday school is we, we study this passage together. And the thing that, the, that stands out to my brother beside me is something I hadn't thought about before. And we sharpen one another and we, and we grow in that. And in marriage, we have these differences. So let's consider what God has done in nature and in his creation for the blending of differences and where we as people are attracted to go when we want to go look at something beautiful so you here in ohio are a little further than what i am from the rocky mountains in the west maybe you've been there but it's a place where people love to go they love to go to the mountains they love to see the majesty of God's creation, those, those peaks that soar into the sky and the snow-covered mountains. But there's a, there's a reason that it's attractive to us. It's because there's a difference. There's a blending. There's a contrast that happens. And that's where the beauty is. We see where the land meets the sky. And we marvel at God's creation and the colors that God has created. There are times in the morning and in the evening that we stop what we're doing because the sky is such a beautiful color and the sunrise or the sunset, all the different colors as they blend together. And we have these things. They contrast one another and we just marvel at the beauty of God's creation. And it blends together. People love to take time and go to the beach where the land and the water meet. They go to the mountains where the land and the sky meet. Distinct things. What makes a sunset or a sunrise beautiful is the light and the darkness. Creating the colors. Now, it sounds ridiculous to say, well, what if the water thought it needed to be the land and the land needed to be the water? They have their distinct place as God has placed them. And in marriage, God has His design that He's created. He has created the man and He's created the woman. And they each have their distinct characteristics. And in order for us to blend together, we must embrace who God has made us to be. It's a beautiful thing, what God has. We come from homes. There's ideas that the way that we did things in my house when we were growing up and the way she did things in their house growing up, these things need to be blended. And we can get pretty opinionated about these things. There's strengths and weaknesses Both together, you have two homes that come together to make one. We need to recognize God's design. The woman fulfills her calling. The man fulfills his calling. And we can have beautiful homes. We can have beautiful representations of Christ and the church. Blending and meeting these things together. Let's get into our passage this morning. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands. Paul has just finished telling the church that they are to submit one to another. Now he goes into other relationships and he starts with the marriage. And then in chapter 6, he goes into with the children and then he talks about servants. 
employers and employees and so on. And there's this submission that he's, that he's telling us about. And it's this headship order. The husband and wife are to complete each other, not compete with each other, but rather complete each other. Paul writes in Galatians 3.28, he tells us that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. Jesus Christ died for both men and women, either one of us. We're Christians, we can come to God and, and uh, we're made together and we complete one another. And there are talents that we have inside of our relationships that, I, that may I'm better at this particular thing than my wife is and my wife is better at this than I am. And I need to recognize that and allow her to fulfill her role that God has called her to be, to allow her to complete me because let's be honest, men, we've got a lot of rough edges. And, 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 the, and the women can can uh, help us so much with that. And we can help. And we can help our wives with that as well. We complete one another. He tells us, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Let me ask you, sisters, how are you submitted to Christ? That's your ultimate submission. That's your first submission. That is who you are. You, you come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You are all. You're, you're all is committed to Him. And He says... Also to your husbands to be submitted. And submitted is not a dirty word. It's not a bad word. Because we'll see too the husband's role in loving his wife. As unto the Lord. How submitted are you? He goes on in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. And here we see he's rooted in creation. And we'll also notice that uh, at the end of the chapter how he, he, he goes back to creation. And Paul in his exhortation about the, the headship veiling and teaching that doctrine in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he goes back to creation. And it's rooted in creation. In the beginning, this is how God designed it. And He set it up. Back to the beginning. Husbands, as our wives submitting to us, being the head of of our wife does not give us this privilege of dominance over her, but rather responsibility. Do we have responsible men here this morning? Do we have responsible men in the church recognizing what God has called them to do, what God has called them to fulfill? Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, let him be your servant. We're servants. Because he tells us here, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Christ is the head of the church. And to back up just a little bit, men, as head of our wife, we're responsibility. We have re we're responsible for that. To protect our home from both physical dangers and spiritual dangers. As the leader of your home, you're the first one up and the last one down. No snooze buttons. First one up, last one down. Can we do that? Leading out. Being who God has called us to be. Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of your body. Men, Jesus Christ is your model. He's the model servant. And we look at what Jesus is, what Jesus' greatest work was is that He gave Himself for the church. And what did that gift consist of but death? Men, you get to die first. How do you meet your wife's needs? Do we listen to her heart, to her distresses, to her sorrows, making sure that her needs are met both physically, emotionally, and spiritually? There's a calling. Does Jesus meet our needs as men? He does. What about us to our wives? Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. In verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And we see Paul ping-ponging back and forth here, making his point. And I ask you, this morning, how is the church submitted to Christ? How are we subject to Christ? The church receives our love and our loyalty. 
our resources, our talents. That's what it's for. We submit ourselves to the church unto Christ. And then he says, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Love, loyalty, not just a little, not part ways, but in everything he tells us. Even if you don't feel like it, he tells us this is the doctrine of marriage. And then in verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And it's kind of a, he, he's, he drives the same point home about two, three times in here, the same thing. And I ask you, he, Paul tells the wives to submit to the husbands here. But does this love that the husbands need to have for their wives, does it go deeper than the submission does even? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Love as Christ loved. Given completely over to her. As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Have we given ourselves to our marriage? To love her is to involve her in decisions. Remember, we're not dominating over her. To search out her ideas. To include and to protect her interests and, and appreciate and give place to her abilities. Here a while back, um, a little story here is our, our dog had a litter of puppies. And one Sunday morning we get up. And the children love these puppies. I'm, I'm not that much of an animal lover. And my wife loved these puppies. And we were, the children were having lots of fun with them. And they were about three weeks old, three, four weeks old, I believe, at this time. And we get up a Sunday morning, and there's no puppies anywhere. Usually they're on the porch. And I could tell that, you know, this, this distressed my wife. Where are the puppies? And... You know, for me, it's like, well, the puppies will just show up, right? You know, it's not that big of a deal. They don't mean that much to me. And then the children get up, and my wife tells her, the puppies are gone, and all of a sudden, you know, the children are worried about these puppies. Where are the puppies? So we prayed about it as a family, and two puppies popped out of the garden. Like, my wife and I had went around the house. I went out and helped her look, and we couldn't, don't have a lot of places for them to hide, except there's a large cornfield around our place, and I just thought, well, the puppies must have went in the cornfield, and they're gone. Well, we prayed about it with the children, and two of them popped out of the, uh, out of the garden. Like, oh, well, we must have missed them when we went, walked around the garden, didn't see them there. We went to church that morning, and I thought that, well, when we get back, surely the puppies will be back. Well, it's 95 degrees, hot outside, and... We're worrying about these puppies. The children are distressed about it. My wife's distressed about it. And, well, I don't like seeing my family unhappy or worried about something. So I went out and started looking for puppies. And it's 95 degrees, and I'm out going through this cornfield looking for puppies. And I searched out there for about an hour till I was pretty much completely exhausted. And I came back in the house, and I said, I can't find the puppies. And my wife made a statement to me. She said, you must really love me that you went out on a Sunday afternoon searching for puppies in a cornfield where the, where the stalks are two feet higher than my head, and it was hot out there. I didn't really think about it. I was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe, maybe that's why I did that. I, I don't know, but do we lay down our own interests? Because I like to often on a Sunday afternoon to take a nap. That's what I would prefer to be doing than looking for puppies. But do we love the things? Does the thing that my wife loves, do I love that because I love her? Do I care about her heart and the things that matter to her? And then we go in and we start to see about Christ's love for the church and, and how this, how Christ loves the church, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Jesus' love for the church is a purifying love. The church, does the church bloom when Christ loves it? It does. It changes us. We're changed by the love of Christ. And you can see, you can see in a marriage when a wife is loved by her husband. 
There's just something, you, there's something about it. There's a man that told me once, he said, you know, he said he can look. He can look at a picture of a husband and wife and he can see whether that wife is cherished by her husband or not because you can just see it on her face, in her eyes, whether she is loved by her husband. Paul uses three clauses here in Christ's intentions for the church. And I ask you this morning, brothers, is this our heart for our wives? And the first one is sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the water by the word. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The words of Jesus, his word washes us and cleanses us and it changes us. Brothers, How is our conversation towards our wives? Do our words build her up, sanctify her, cleanse her? What kind of words are we speaking to her? Words that purify or brighten her heart? James tells us that in the tongue is life or death. What kind of words do we speak to our wives? Words of consolation when she's distressed. You know, I have to think that maybe some of the remarks that I made about the puppies weren't the kindest to my wife, you know. She was distressed about this in my indifferent attitude. Words of appreciation for what she does. How thankful are we? Does your wife do a lot for you, men? She does. It's a miracle. I come home and there's clean clothes in my drawers. There's food on the table. The house is clean. And so on. But how often do I forget to say thank you? How often do I tell God thank you for what He's done in my life? You're single here this morning. How thankful are you for the, re- for the cleansing, the sanctifying of God's Word to you? Thankfulness. Are we thankful? Words of affirmation to who she is. Words of delight for her beauty. Women want to be told by their husbands, by the man in their life, that they're beautiful. And when she's struggling, you have words of insight for her struggles. And the reason here is is he might he cleanses it, sanctifies and cleanses it with the washing of the water by the word that he might and this is the second clause present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Husbands, do we have this desire to have this marriage that brings God great glory, this clean, this pure marriage not having spot or wrinkle men and those of you that are married if you remember back and seeing your wife for the first time on your wedding day your heart skipped a beat there's nothing quite like it but i'd like to draw your attention to a wedding that's coming in the future that every single one of us is invited to if we if we accept that invitation that wedding of Christ and His church in heaven. In Revelation 19.8, He tells us, And to her, talking about the church, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. A holy church, without spot or wrinkle. He wants to present to Himself a glorious church. And the third one is without blemish, holiness here. That it should be holy and without blemish. Is your marriage holy? You remember your vows? I had to think about it here at sunlight this morning. There are several older married couples here that are entering their twilight years. And some of those vows way back when for better or for worse maybe coming true a little more than what they did at one time. Are you completely devoted one to another? Till death do us part. Holy to oneness. The church keeps itself 
holy unto God. And then he tells us, verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. And he's referring back, this is how it should be. So I'd like to challenge you men this morning. Are we providing homes, holy homes? Remember, you are the leader. You are called to be the leader of your home. Are you guarding the door of your home? Ezekiel cried out for a man to stand in the gap and he did not find any. Oh, I trust that that is not the issue today in the church. God looking for men to stand in the gap and there aren't any. But what are you allowing in your door? In the door of your home? A man, a man that loves the things of God. He's fiercely guarding the door of his home. The door is an access point. How many times as, as fathers or mothers do we tell the children, close the door. Close the door. Because in the wintertime, the, the cold air can come in. And the snow or whatever it is. In the summertime, the hot air comes in. The AC's on. Don't you, aren't you, if, you, if you paid the bill around here, you'd keep that door shut. You know, that kind of thing. But fathers, what are you letting in the door? So if you take a building and you open the door for just a little bit to, to go inside, access inside, you can take things inside, good things inside. But if you leave the door open overnight, maybe some mice will get in. Or a bird or something. But if you leave the door open for a continual time, have you ever been in an abandoned house and the door's open or there's a broken window or something like that? And the coons get in there. Do you have coons in Ohio here? They get in there and they tear things up. And they ruin things. Access points. Men. What are we allowing in the doors of our home? Just reflect on that. What are we allowing in the door of our home that we would have these holy homes without blemish? Homes that children can be raised in, in safety and security and taught the pure gospel of Christ. This is what loving our wives, loving our families looks like is guarding the door. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. She's an extension of you. You are now one flesh. There's a oneness there. When she hurts, you should hurt. Just as in the church, when there's people that are hurting, our hearts bleed with them. I sense that there's a bleeding here this morning at, at sunlight. There's a, there's a couple here that, that she is burying her 16-year-old sister tomorrow. Your hearts hurt with them one member of the body suffers the rest suffer with it and when our wife is hurting brothers we need to hurt with her and when our husbands is are hurting us as wives need to be need to be hurting with them we love each other we're an extension of one another there's a oneness there we take care of ourselves don't we men you look healthy. Looks like you're getting enough food and water. What happens when you hurt yourself? Sometimes when I'm working on a vehicle, that wrench will slip and I'll have some missing skin off of a knuckle pretty quick. I usually take care of that, especially if it's, if it's really... Some, sometimes you can cut yourself pretty good. You'll bandage that up, or if you sprain your ankle or something like that, you'll... You'll hobble around on that. You'll take care of it. You don't just power through, but you take care of it. You love your body. You want it to last you and to take care of you. When you're sick, you go to the doctor. You take medicine. You take care of it. What about your, your spouse's hurt or need? Do we minister to that? Or just tell them to get over it? He who loves his wife loveth himself. Verse 29, For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. Jesus loves and cherishes the church, and He takes care of us. He promised us in, uh, in, uh, 
in Philippians 4 verse 9 that He has supply our every need. But my God shall supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And in Hebrews 13 5 He says that He will... That he will never leave us nor forsake us. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Is that us in our, in our marriages today? Nourishing and cherishing and supplying needs one for another. Because he says in verse 30, We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are partakers of Christ. Peter tells us we're partakers of the divine nature. And our marriage is our representation of this Christ and the church relationship. So can, can the people in the church see that you love each other? Can, the, can society see that you love each other? That you, that you cherish each other? That we're, that we're one. We're unified. We're together on this. Because in verse 31, he tells us, for this cause, and we see Paul going back to the creation thing again. He says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. There's a leaving that happens in marriage. You leave that home behind. Yes, it's part of you. You can never not make it part of you. But, it, but you go and you establish a new home. Two homes becoming one shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Two becoming one. I don't know exactly how that happens. But something when the marriage vows and at the marriage altar, there's this thing that happens and there's something written in heaven. There's these hearts that are knit together. We cannot explain it, but it's a spiritual reality. God knits them together and they become one. Till death do them part. Leaving and cleaving. Husbands, you're leaving home. Wives, you're leaving home. Your prior family takes second, takes second seat. One of my uncles was telling me a story here a while back. His, uh, I think all of his children are married now, but he told me, he said something that made him feel really small was his daughter had gotten married and he was concerned about the direction that they were going in life, uh, spiritual choices that they were making. So he went and he talked to his daughter about it. And a day or two later, her husband came to him and scolded him for doing that. And he said, this is the reason. He said, you gave your daughter to me. And if you have a concern where our home is going, you come talk to me. And he said, I felt about this small. But I think he's right. Okay? I have never gone to the marriage altar and given a child away. But there's a new home that's starting and now they are one. And if there's something that needs to be discussed with them, it needs to be done together. There is a leaving and cleaving this one flesh thing joining together let not man put asunder what god has joined together divorce is rampant in in our society today and in malachi 2 verse 16 he talks about god hates divorce for the lord the god of israel saith that he hateth putting away for one cover the violence with his garment saith the lord of hosts therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously when the, when the Pharisees came to Jesus and, and, and questioned Him about marriage, what did Jesus do? Jesus went back to the beginning and said, in the beginning it was not so. This, they were asking Him if it was lawful for this putting away, but He went back to the creation mandate and He said, God established it this way and the reason that divorce is allowed is because of the hardness of your heart. And, and Jesus took it back to creation. Two or one flesh. And then Paul, he speaks here in verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And it is a mystery. Proverbs tells us that also. 
These things are a, a mystery. The way of an eagle in the air. The way of a serpent upon a rock. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea. And the way of a man with a maid. These things are a mystery. We don't understand exactly how this works. And we don't understand exactly how Christ's sanctifying process with the church. We don't know exactly all the mechanics of how this works. And that's okay. We don't have to have it all dialed in because if we had everything dialed in, we wouldn't need any faith. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then in the end here, verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Each one of you in particular and he gives an instruction to the men and he gives an instruction to the women. This passage as he appeals to us to love and to submit. I'd like to circle back just a little bit to this thing of submission. Men, we need to submit to Christ, do we not? What is a characteristic of a good leader? It's that of submission. How are we submitted to Christ? Ask yourself that question. Am I submitted to the Lordship of Christ, His commandments, His teachings? When I am, am chastened by the Lord, do I submit to the chastening hand of the Lord and allow Him to mold me and make me into the man that I'm, I'm supposed to be? Do we do that? And then we want our wives to be submissive to us. First, men, we are the ones that submit to the Lordship of Christ. He tells us here in verse 33, Let each one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Back in creation, God told Eve that her desire would be to her husband. And us men, we do not particularly understand love as well as women do, do we? We understand respect more. And wives understand love better than they understand respect for men. Sometimes we get that backwards. But a woman craves love. And she has this intense thing that she desires love from her husband. But alongside of that comes this fear that she may not be lovable. So husbands, do you tell your wife that you love her both in word and in deed? your self-sacrifice to her. Maybe um, there's something that uh, you like to do. I'll pick on myself here. I, one of the things I enjoy doing immensely is a hobby that I have. I enjoy playing disc golf. And my children, my two boys, like to play with me. And sometimes it's a beautiful, say it's a beautiful Tuesday evening. And we got things wrapped up at the shop nicely, and you know, I've got a couple hours kind of free this evening, and there's a course just less than 10 minutes down the road, and I, I, I want to go out and play with the boys. And I get home, and things are upside down. That ever happened in your home where things have gone south, and it's not working out, and I see that my wife has had it up to here. Well, honey, you're doing fine. I'm going to go I'm going to go do what I want to do tonight. And my wife is a good submissive wife, so she lets me go do that. Or can I say I see you're having a rough day. Why don't you go sit down and I'll get supper on the table. You've almost done with it, and then I'll take care of the dishes and everything afterward and and I'm, I'm going to love you. I'm going to die for you. Or maybe you want to go fishing or hunting or something. But you say no to the thing that you want to do because you're, you love your wife more. Can we do that? Can we do that? So, and we see here that the wife see that she reverence or respect her husband. 
And I mentioned that wives can be insecure about this love thing. Am I lovable? Well, a fear with men is, is maybe I'm incompetent. I, I, I'm not worthy of respect. And we, can, and we can kind of live out of that. And we desire this respect from our, from our wives. The Amplified Bible captures this verse in this way. Let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, loves and admires him exceedingly. Respect to a man is what love is to a woman. Paul does not say here, only love the wife when she's lovable and to respect the husband only when he's respectable. Something that I'm amazed by in my shop there when I'm dealing with the public society around, sometimes there's some negative things and it seems to come from the older ones mostly, is they will say derogatory things about their spouse. Well, I got to talk to the ball and chain about this. Or some colorful descriptions of, of their spouse, husband or wife. They both do it. And they're like miserable together. It's almost you can just see it. They don't love each other. They don't cherish each other. But it's so ex- refreshing and exciting to see when there's, a, when there's an old couple that comes in or we, or we meet them and you can see that they love each other. They cherish each other. They respect each other. And they don't talk negative about their spouse to you. Let's, be, let's speak words of life. Words of life one to another. And in our weakest moments, in my weakest moments, when, I, when I'm struggling to find direction for the family or I'm, I'm struggling with something, and my wife comes and she tells me that I believe in you I respect you, and the decision that you make, I will support you in that. I could fly over mountains with my, with my wife doing that. And, and men, when our, when our wives feel the ugliest and feel, feel like everything's out of control, we can come alongside and love her. Can we do that? In our weakest moments, we need that from each other. We need that. A few closing thoughts here. Healthy marriages make for a healthy church. Healthy homes. Healthy churches make for a healthier society. May our marriages, as we go through life, be a living testimony of what God is doing in the church, His power and His salvation in the church. May our marriages be representations of what Christ has done to the church. It's a tremendous responsibility that God has given to us. God has entrusted us with our marriages to manifest to the society around us what Christ has done to the ch- for the church. We should tremble at that. Can we do that? Brothers, let's guard the doors of our home. Let's make our homes a safe place to bring up, to, to have our wives living in there with us and to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And wives... Let's respect our husbands. Let's walk beside him. Speak life into him. Support him. And yeah, my wife has a lot of good advice, brothers. Okay? Can we listen to each other? Just as in the church, as we relate one to another and we mesh and blend our differences together, we have a church that is fulfilling and we sharpen one another and we grow. May the marriages at Sunlight Chapel be growing and flourishing and showing the world around them what Christ has done for the church. Let's kneel for a word of prayer. Holy, eternal Father, as we pause before you, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for what you've shown to us through what Christ has done on the cross. And the exhortation that Paul gives us to to love our wives, to submit to our husbands, and the instruction that's given. Father, I pray that we would be willing to accept Your way, because Your way is best. 
Father, I pray that for the congregation here, the married ones, the unmarried ones, wherever they find themselves in life, that their relationship with the church, their relationship with one another would be one that reflects what you have done of self-sacrifice for the good of others. Father, pray a blessing upon the homes here. Be with the fathers as they guard the door of their home. Give them discernment and wisdom for the, for the times that we live in. Oh, show them the things that they should allow and the things that they shouldn't. Father, I pray that as they lead their homes that you would equip them, that they could stand in the gap, that they would be safe and as good leaders, that, the, that wives could uh, respect them and cherish them and be together with them and they could be this unified couple that is going on and, and the world around can see that here's the people that love each other. Here's a home that reflects what Christ has done for the church. Father, I just pray that you would impress upon our hearts the sacredness, the holiness of marriage, the responsibility that you've given to us. You've entrusted this sacred responsibility to us of representing what Christ has done to the church, to society around us. Father, I pray that we would be humble, that we would blend our differences together and recognize the strengths in each other. Well, Father, go with us. Help us to be a light to the people around us. Father, I just pray that you would equip us, empower us. It's an honor and a privilege to be part of your family, to be called your child. We love you. We desire to serve you with all our heart, soul, and mind. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, Travis, for exhorting us. I was wondering how well our marriages are representing Jesus Christ in the church. I was reminded what he spoke about society's derogatory marks towards the spouse. So I have a elderly gentleman as a technician come into work. I asked him about his family. He's new. I didn't know him at all, hardly. And a couple days later, he was working there, and he, 3 o'clock, rolls around. He says, Keith, I got to go. It's my anniversary. I said, well, great. He goes... Yeah, it's my 42nd anniversary. He said, I tell you, that's just a long, long marriage. I said, really? Well, I said, there's just not a lot of people that get 42 years out of their marriage. I said, that's, that's commendable. Oh, it's been a long time. And then he says something that I've never heard before. He says, you know what? He said, divorces are so expensive because they're worth it. That's what he told me. How do you think the spouse feels? Do you think that represents Jesus Christ? I didn't, didn't know how to recover from that one. So thank you for being here. And there is a carry-in lunch prepared. Everybody is welcome. Plan to be here, plan to eat here, and fellowship around the table. So ask you to rise for a blessing on the food and the dismissal prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning's hour, this message, showing us what you expect from our marriages, showing us what you have created, showing us what you desire. Bless Brother Travis for speaking clearly and expounding upon the word and um, teaching us. May we benefit, may we be blessed. May our marriages radiate Jesus Christ and the church. Thank you for the provisions that have been made, for the food that is prepared, for a time of fellowship around the tables. May you bless our time together, our unity. May we enjoy the time together. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed be the time.